this holy and hallowed and sanctified place. We thank God for another Lord's Day. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I am reminded what the psalmist said. He said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let us bow for a word of invocation. God, we come to you this morning to say thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. You have been good to us. In fact, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your kindness, your patience. We thank you, Lord. You've been faithful to us. Now, God, we ask that you'll forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we invite you into this worship service, Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you will inhabit the praises of the saints. We pray, O oh God, that you will be pleased and that you will be satisfied with the worship that is offered to you today. These and all other blessings we ask in the name of Jesus. And for his sake we pray, amen and thank God. Amen. At this time, I'd like to read a passage of scripture in your hearing. I will be reading from Luke, the uh, 14th chapter. Luke, the 14th chapter. Uh, starting at the first verse. Luke 14, starting at the first verse. I'm reading from the New International Version. It reads like this. Luke, the 14th chapter, starting at the first verse from the New International Version. It reads like this. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child, or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Thus, in the reading of the scripture, I read in your hearing from the New International Version, Luke, the 14th chapter, I read the first 11 verses. At this time, we want to prepare our hearts and our minds for our altar prayer. Uh, we want to uh, continue to pray for those who are sick and suffering with uh, the coronavirus. Um, people are still passing, um, dying from this dreaded disease. There is still, uh, the, the, the world is still in need of healing, brothers and sisters. Pastors are still passing on and dying. And uh, we certainly want to pray for uh, their families, the congregations that they have left behind. Um, we want to pray for uh, those who are in the hospitals, in the nursing homes, uh, 
um, in prison, in jails, other institutions of confinement. We know that though they may be shut in, they are not shut out from uh, God's grace and his mercy. So we want to pray for them. We want to pray for all pastors everywhere. Uh, anyone who stand before God's people and declare what thus saith the Lord. We certainly want to pray for them. And uh, we want to pray for all of our first responders, our doctors, our nurses, our technicians. Um, let's pray for our young people, our children. Um, school is uh, about to open. And brothers and sisters, we need to be praying for our children. We need to be praying for our teachers. We need to be praying for our parents and grandparents, all of our guardians, the administrators of our school districts. We just, we just need to be, we need to be prayed up, brothers and sisters. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it because these are certainly praying times. And so we know that the God we serve is not only a prayer hearing, but he is a prayer answering God. So let us bow for a word of prayer. God, we come to you this morning to say thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. God, you have been so good to us. You have been kind. You've been patient. You've been faithful. And so, God, we come to you casting our cares on you because we know you care for us. God, we're still in the midst of some trying times. God, people are still dying all over this world. Families are in bereavement. People are dying all alone, unable to say farewell to their loved ones. But numbers keep increasing. And God, there is no one that we can turn to but you. And so, Lord, we're, we're asking you to have mercy upon us because mercy really does suit our case. We realize, Lord, that all have sinned. All have come short of your glory. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so, God, we're asking you, we're pleading with you, we're begging you, Lord, to please forgive us of our shortcomings. This world is in need of your forgiveness. God, we have strayed from your uh, appointed ways. We have been rebellious. We have been willful. We have been stiff-necked. God, we're asking you to just have mercy upon us. Forgive us, Lord, and try us one more time. God, we're asking in the name of Jesus that you will have your way in our lives. Whatever we stand in the need of, whatever we're lacking, whatever we need, whatever, uh, whatever you want us to have, God, give it to us, grant it for us, so that we can live to your glory, so that we can live to your praise, to your honor. God, we have heard that if, if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways. Lord, you have promised to hear from heaven. You have promised to heal our, uh, our land, forgive our sins. And so, God, we're trusting you with your word, Lord. We're counting on you to be reliable to your word. For you are not a man that you should lie. God, we're depending on you to remember what you have promised us, what you have said to us. God, there's a few of us holding on to your word. There's a few of us believing you and trusting you and relying on you. And so, God, in the name of Jesus, honor our faith, Lord, in the name of Jesus, and have your way. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you will bless the members of South Hempstead, all of our family, all of our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones. Lord, in the name of Jesus, as we prepare for a national election, God, in the name of Jesus, you know what we're standing in the need of. So, God, we're asking you, Lord, to have mercy. Have mercy because mercy is what we need. Now, God, we ask that when we have done all that we've assigned to your hands, that you will be so kind to give us a home in glory where we may continue to give your name the praise, the glory, the honor throughout ceaseless ages. Lord, these are our, these, it is, this is our prayer in the name of Jesus and for his sake we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we know that God is a, is a, is a, a prayer hearing and a prayer hearing.
prayer hearing and a prayer answering God, we want to remind you no matter what it looks like, God is greater than what it looks like. No matter what it feels like, God is greater than what it feels like. And we want to put our trust in him. Uh, and certainly, he has not brought us this far to leave us. So we thank God for the privilege and the power of prayer. At this time, brothers and sisters, we want to prepare our hearts and our minds for the giving of our tithes and our offerings. I made a special appeal somewhat last week. I want to, uh, again, uh, make that same appeal <clears throat> to our members of the South Hempstead Baptist Church, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, our financial responsibilities still continue during this pandemic season. And, uh, and, and I know, I know it's rough on everyone financially, I know it is. But certainly, if there's any way that you can continue to be a blessing to that house of God, we know that God will take care of your house. And so, members, please, give as the Lord has blessed you to give. And then, and then what I want to do is to uh, particularly appeal to all of our friends and uh, all of our neighbors, those who tune in to the worship service here at uh, South Hempstead Baptist Church. I, I want to appeal to your goodness and to your generosity. If this ministry is a blessing to you, please, please be a blessing to this ministry. And so uh, there are four ways that you can give. You can swing by the church and drop your tithes, your offering, your donation uh, into our secure mailbox. You can put your tithes or offering, your donation into uh, an envelope uh, and address it to the South Hempstead Baptist Church, 81 Maple Avenue, Hempstead, New York, 11550. Put a stamp on it, put it in the mailbox, and we will get it a little later this week, and we certainly will appreciate it when we receive it. You can give also via Givelify. You can also give via uh, cash app, absolutely. And so there is a way uh, that you can give, and we certainly want to encourage each and every one of you to give as the Lord has given to you. Certainly the saying is correct. You cannot beat God's giving, no matter how hard you try. Even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, the more you give, the more the Lord will give to you. At this time, we're going to ask if our music ministry will give us a song, a good giving song, amen, as we prepare to give our tithes and our offerings. Thank you so much. Lord, multiply them, sanctify them, 
Use them, Lord, for the purpose in which they are given and they are received. Bless, Lord, not only the gifts, but Lord, please, Jesus, bless those who were able to give. Thank you, Lord, for their generosity, their faithfulness, their cheerfulness, and their obedience. I pray, O oh God, that they will not lack anything because of their giving. Then, God, we pray that you'll bless not only the gifts and the givers, but, Lord, in a way that only you can do. Please, Jesus, bless those of us who may not have had to give today. Open financial doors in their lives so that they, too, Lord, will experience the joy and the blessing of giving. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And thank God. Amen. Amen. I certainly want to make a couple of announcements uh, this morning. First of all, I, I, I want to thank the Sunday school superintendent, assistant Sunday school superintendent, all of our Sunday school teachers and all of our Sunday school students for supporting the South Hempstead Baptist Church Sunday School every Sunday morning at 9.30. Thank you so much. And I certainly want to encourage each and every one of us to uh, continue to support our midweek Wednesday noon prayer service on our free conference call number. And I want to encourage you to continue to support our Friday evening at 7 p.m. prayer service on our free conference call. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Also, I'd like to announce that the uh, Eastern Baptist Association ushers and nurses uh, will have a virtual crusade for Christ revival uh, this week, this week. Uh, or was it last week? Ah, I got this kind of late. Okay, all right. Well, we know it was it was well supported. Thank you very, very much. Um, also, let me quickly just say this. I got one more announcement. One more announcement. One more. Um, please join on next Sunday as Phaedra. Uh, Faith McDowell will uh, bring the word, will bring the word, she'll be preaching at International House of Hope and Healing Ministries. The flyer will be posted on our Facebook page uh, within, uh, with more information, with more information this coming week. And so next week uh, in the afternoon, I think it's, I think the service starts at one o'clock, but anyway, just, just look for the fly that will be posted on South Hempstead Facebook page next Sunday. Pedro will be bringing the word at International House of Hope and Healing Ministries. And of course, you can get, it's a Zoom service. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Diaz is the pastor of International House of Hope and Healing Ministry, Ministries. And uh, there, it'll be a Zoom service. And when we get the flyer, we will make sure that uh, you uh, have the Zoom number so that you can join in. All right, brothers and sisters, thank you so much. We're so happy to be here on this third Sunday in August. God has been good to each and every one of us. And at this time, uh, we're going to ask uh, if our music ministry will come back and bless us with a selection of their choosing. Let's say amen as they come forward. Amen.
selection. Brothers and sisters, it's good to be in the land of the living. It is absolutely good to be in the land of the living. And uh, I have said this on more than one occasion. I think that uh, this pandemic should teach all of us a lot of lessons, a lot of things. But one of the things that I think this pandemic should teach us that is that uh, it is a blessing to be in worship. It is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord and to be uh, in the land of the living. So I want to turn your attention to the passage of scripture that I read in your hearing earlier. Uh, that is Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke, the 14th chapter. Again, I'll read it. Uh, starting at the first verse, Luke 14, 1 through 11, from the New International Version, reads like this. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Then he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table. He told them this parable. I'm sorry, let me just say verse 7 again. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I have read in your hearing from the New International Version, Luke, the 14th chapter. I read verses 1 down to and including the uh, 11th verse. The word of the Lord is blessed. Let us bow for a word of prayer. God, thank you, Lord, for your word. For we realize that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. We ask, O oh God, that you will speak a word to us, a word that will help each and every one of us live more like Christ. Lord, if there's anyone who is listening to this message, who by the way of your Holy Spirit feel convicted to give their lives to you, we pray, O oh God, that you will do it for your glory and for your satisfaction. Now, Lord, I ask that you'll fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Use me, Lord, as an instrument to bring glory to your name and clarity to your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And thank God. Amen. It is that 11th verse that I, I really will focus on more than anything. The 11th verse says from the New International Version, for those, for all those who have... Uh, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so for the next few moments, I want to speak from the subject, the great reversal, the great reversal. More than any other gospel writer, Luke develops a theology some scholars call the great reversal. This theology maintains that God in his infinite wisdom reserves the right to go contrary to popular opinion. Since God is omnipotent, 
He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with whomever he wants to do it with. He is sovereign, brothers and sisters. In essence, this idea of the great reversal says the very thing you and I might normally expect, God is able to do the exact opposite. He is able to reverse the outcome of our preconceived notions. Succinctly put, the great reversal says those who are last will be first. And those who are first will be last. Luke develops this theology, this idea of God, by highlighting Jesus' concern and companion and compassion for those who are the outcasts of society. In Luke's gospel, Jesus interacts and fellowships with Gentiles. He fellowships with uh, Samaritans. He fellowships with women, with the poor. Jesus fellowship with tax collectors and sinners and others who are considered low on the social totem pole of the day. In other words, those who were often overlooked were the very ones Jesus gave his attention to. Believed to be a Gentile himself, Luke is careful to stress that salvation is offered to Gentiles as well as to Jews. His genealogy of Jesus extends beyond Abraham, the father of the Jews, and goes back and goes back all the way to Adam, showing Jesus' relationship to the whole human race. For example, read Luke's gospel carefully, and you will discover every time he mentions a tax collector, it is done in a positive sense. One needs only to recall uh, his treatment of Levi, the tax collector, who became, uh, who left his, his, his job and, and joined Jesus' disciples. Or Zacchaeus, uh, who was up in the sycamore tree. These are just two tax collectors who was embraced by the master. As despised as Samaritans were, Luke offers a favorable portrait of them, of the Samaritans. Luke is the only gospel writer who records the parable of the Good Samaritan or tells us of the ten lepers who were healed and that only one, a Samaritan, returned to thank Jesus. Only Luke tells us of some women who had been cured of evil diseases and evil spirits. Uh, women such as Mary called Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Cousin, Susanna, and many other women who financially supported Jesus' ministry out of their own pocket. Unlike the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel, which spiritualizes poverty by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus does not say that. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor, period. End of sentence. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is not only Jesus is not only anointed to preach good news to the poor, but also to proclaim freedom to the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, the release of the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so, by emphasizing Jesus's concern and compassion for women, for Samaritans, for tax collectors, and for the poor, Luke is clearly teaching us that God not only has the ability, but he also has the desire to upset the proverbial apple cart. Luke seems to be reminding us that all of God's children have worth and that none of us should ever look down our nose on any of them. The very ones we despise are the very ones God holds in high esteem. 
If in no other gospel, it is in Luke's gospel that Jesus proves that women, the weaker sex, have worth in God's eyes. That Samaritans and all half-breeds have worth in God's eyes. That black, brown, red, yellow, and all Gentiles have worth in God's eyes. And that tax collectors and sinners of all strengths. I knew it would happen. I knew it would happen. Can I just read that thing? And that sinners. Ooh, child. Now I'm going to struggle. Thank you. And that, and that, uh, uh, and that sinners of all strengths have worth in God's eyes. The idea, the idea of the great reversal should offer hope and comfort to those of us who struggle just to survive. It reminds us that life will not always be like this. But this concept of the great reversal should also warn those of us who mistreat our brothers and sisters. We should be well assured that God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Our text, Luke 14, uh, 1 through uh, 11, sometimes known as the parable uh, of the uh, ambitious guest, throws light on the subject of the great reversal. While we know that a parable is, a, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, strictly speaking, um, these words do not constitute what is traditionally known as a parable, uh, verses uh, 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 7 through 11. Those verses do not, do not uh, constitute what is normally traditionally known as a parable. Rather, in these verses, uh, 7 through 11, uh, Jesus is giving an injunction or giving some advice. This advice Jesus is giving entails more than just ethical teachings about how to behave at a meal. More than etiquette is being discussed here. In actuality, these are instructions on what kind of attitude children of God are to have towards themselves and towards others. The advice given here is a parable of how we are to behave in the presence of God. This is more than table talk. This is kingdom talk. According to verse 1 of this chapter, Jesus is at a dinner in the home of a prominent Pharisee. He was invited, but those who invited him had ulterior motives. They watched him with critical and cynical eyes to see if he would heal the man with dropsy or abnormal swelling of his body on the Sabbath day. They wanted to catch him in a trap. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, everyone who smiles in your face is not your friend. Uh, I, I don't want to cause any alarm for you to become paranoid, but everyone who hangs out with you does not mean you any good. Uh, there are people who are waiting in the wings, waiting for you to make a mistake so that they can capitalize on your error in an attempt to make you look bad and make them look good. All I can say is, to your best ability, don't let it happen. After healing the man and sending him away, the scripture says in verse 7 that Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table. In other words, while they were watching him, he was watching them. Yeah. He was paying attention to their behavior. And, and he noticed how they apparently scrambled for positions of prestige. Brothers and sisters, let me remind you that Jesus is still watching us. Uh, even in this pandemic, he's watching how we behave, how we scramble for this position or that, how we treat one another. God is always watching us. So in response to such action, Jesus offered some practical advice. He said, when someone invites you to a wedding, 
uh, do not take the place of honor. That is, do not seek to elevate yourself or to promote your own self-importance. Do not always put yourself out front. And I, I, I gotta say that, that, you know, if we're not careful, we're always, there are people who are always promoting themselves. Uh, they're, 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 what have you done for me lately? They want to always put themselves out front. What these Pharisees, these egotistical maniacs needed to realize was that it's not always about you. There is no place for arrogance, for conceited men and women in the kingdom of God. There is no place for arrogant, conceited men and women in the kingdom of God. Jesus then states the reason why it is always inappropriate for one to seek the seat of honor. For a person more distinguished than you might have been invited. That is, don't be so arrogant as to think you know the entire guest list. The truth is, you don't know who's been invited and who hasn't been invited. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Yeah. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important seat. I'm talking about the great reversal. Yeah. And these verses clearly indicate that if one is not careful, if one is not humble, it is possible to sit in the wrong seat and to be told to get up and sit somewhere else. In the process, one will be humiliated, embarrassed, and belittled. Jesus is not talking about a feeling one has. Rather, this humiliation is an experience that comes to the person, an experience of shame and disgrace. Brothers and sisters, you do know that living outside the will of God can bring shame and disgrace. If one lives contrary to his will, rebel against his law, and seek to establish their own righteousness, it's just a matter of time before they are exposed as the culprits they are. In verse 10, the parabolic instruction continues with a positive command. Jesus says, but when you are invited, take the lowest place. In other words, it's not necessary to jockey for position or to always be seen in front by all. Look, look at the logic Jesus employs. He says, if you take the lowest place, when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. The open uh, and public Shame of the first alternative is contrasted with the open and public honor exhibited in the second. It is interesting that in, in this small, apparent, trivial act that one's character is most accurately reflected. It is during this trite, commonplace activity of simply taking a seat in public that one can learn a lot about a person. Jesus used the setting of a banquet to illustrate not only how we are to act towards each other, but also how we are to behave before God. Meekness and humility are basic to the proper attitudes we are to display in our relationship towards others and towards God. In fact, Paul tells us that meekness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. It is that 11th verse that clearly articulates the great revival, the great reversal. From Jesus' own lips we hear, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. What Jesus is teaching is that Anyone who tries to exalt himself blatantly and cunningly will be humble. And anyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Another way of saying this is a person's position depends on God and not on his or her own 
self-seeking. These verses should speak to our hearts loud and clear. We live in a society where prestige is glamorized. Position is actively sought after. And power is believed to be supreme. People are often intoxicated with ideas of self-importance. They have to be, they have to be seen. They have to be heard. They have to be in charge. Folk are lusting after authority. They are infatuated with ambition. And they are starving for attention. Well, but, but, but my question to you, brothers and sisters, is how does this parable, how does this theology of great revival, a reserve reversal, this great reversal apply to us? Well, let me just say it like this. You may be up today, but tomorrow you may be down. You may have a little money today. Think you have arrived uh, too good to be told anything. The focus of everybody's attention. You may have the best job, uh, live in the best house, uh, eat the best food, and wear the best clothes, but don't think more highly of yourself than you ought because there is such a thing as a great reversal. Listen, for years, even centuries, white people in America have enjoyed what we now call white privilege. It has been such a normal way of life that some have even denied its existence. They have put blinders on their eyes and refused to see and acknowledge how their white skin gives them an advantage over black, brown, and other people of color. But we serve a God of great reversal here in America. White privilege protect white people from police brutality, give them an advantage in the schools they attend, the jobs they are offered, and the salaries they command. They are never followed around by security guards in Nostrum or Bloomingdale or Macy's, never stopped because they drive a fancy, expensive car, never question whether they can afford to purchase a particular item of their choosing. But we serve a God of great reversal. Thank God for eyes are beginning to open. Not all white people are blind. Not all white people are devils. Just like in the days of Jeremiah, God has thousands, millions, countless folk who can truly, who truly call there's a great reversal in the making. It may not be coming as soon as we want, but it's well on its way. God has told us through the prophet Micah what is good and what the Lord requires. And that is to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Well, for those of us who need to hear it. You may be down today, but God has not forgotten you. He is able to lift you up in the presence of your friends and your enemies alike. You may be struggling to pay your bills or wrestling with health care issues beyond your control. What we say
my prayer. At this time, the music ministry will come and bless us with a selection of their music.
listen to this message today and have been convicted by the Holy Spirit to give their life to Christ. And certainly that is our prayer that someone will be helped and will be pointed to Christ um, as their Savior. So we want to extend to you the invitation to discipleship if there are anyone, if there is anyone who uh, has managed to come to this day, have managed to live their entire life up to this present time without giving their lives to Christ. We certainly want to extend to you the opportunity to do that now. So those of you who would like to give your life to Christ, if you'll just bow and repeat this simple prayer after me. Lord God, I confess I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins, that he was buried and rose from the dead and now has all power in his hand. I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I ask that you fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Use me to bring glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And thank God. I believe if you prayed that prayer, that you have indeed giving your life to Christ that you are now a child of the king all things have passed away behold all things have become new so we certainly want to invite you to call us at the South Hempstead Baptist Church um, 516-481-7090 and uh, let us know that you've given your life to Christ I certainly want to encourage you to join a Bible-believing church. Uh, I certainly want to encourage you to consider South Hempstead uh, as your church. And so again, uh, please call um, area code 516-481-7090. Please leave your name, your number. Uh, I will get back with you and we will continue um, to have dialogue and fellowship as you continue to walk with God. Brothers and sisters, we have had a wonderful time here today. We thank God for his, for this privilege to worship him in spirit and in truth. And we certainly thank God for uh, his ability to uh, cause a great reversal in our lives. And so we know that the first will be last and the last will be first. Yes. And we know that God is able to keep his word. Let us now bow for our closing prayer and benediction. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this worship experience. Thank you, Lord, for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, what our hearts have felt. God, we pray, oh Lord, that you will remind us that we should never look down on anyone. Then God, we pray that you will help us to keep the faith. That we don't, that we don't throw in a towel when things get rough. That we know that you still are large and in charge. Bless the social unrest in our nation all around this world. We pray, oh God, that all of your children will be treated with utmost respect. Black and white, red and yellow. We pray, oh God, that you and you alone will get all the glory, the praise, and the honor. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God who is our Savior, be glory and majesty dominion and power, both now and forever. Let us all sing together.